Thank you. Um, thank you, everybody, for joining us for this second session of our uh, Big ID conference. Uh, it's my great pleasure to welcome uh, uh, for this second session Jeff Wittig. Uh, Jeff is a chief product officer of Ampere. Uh, he has been working in the last like uh, three, four years, three, uh, a bit more than three years um, uh, towards like the rise of Ampere. Uh, and he did that after a 15-year career at uh, at Intel, uh, and uh, with uh, the several last several years at Intel working in the cloud and custom silicon uh, division. Ampere is uh, ambitiously bringing to market what the company qualifies as the first cloud-native processor. Uh, it's an ARM-based uh, 128-core chip, uh, which, as we speak, as we speak, is making its debuts in um, in the market. Uh, so I won't say more. Uh, Jeff is uh, the chief product officer. He has a, a, a presentation for, uh, for us and a set of prepared remarks. Uh, I'll let him on screen for, for that, and I'll be back after the presentation for Q&A. All right. Thanks, Pierre. Let me go ahead and start sharing. OK. So thanks, Pierre, for the, the introduction. Uh, as Pierre mentioned, I am the Chief Product Officer at Ampere. And I'm gonna talk today about our, our big idea, which is uh, the emergence and the creation of cloud-native processors for today's era of computing. So as many of you are, are familiar with, we've gone through several different eras of computing over the last 50 years or so. If we go all the way back to the 1960s, the market was dominated by mainframe computers. Uh, they were running specialized software. Uh, and over time, the usage model changed. The emergence of client PCs uh, ushered in a new era of the client server uh, paradigm. And the usage model changed. And then in exchange, the software model uh, began to change as well. Software moved to uh, becoming less specialized, but still big monolithic applications uh, running across commodity servers that were connected to client machines. And so the usage model changed, the software changed, and then the hardware changed uh, in the data center in order to best take advantage of the usage model and the software. And we're right in the middle of that change again. We're right in the middle of that third era of computing. Now, the change in usage model from the client server model to the cloud model, that's not new. We've been in the midst of that for over a decade. And the software change has also been going on for almost 10 years, the move towards microservices to containerized applications. So that shift from big monolithic applications to, uh, to really cloud native applications, that's happened. Uh, what hasn't happened yet though, is the large shift in hardware to serve that usage model and that software uh, model. And that's what we're in the midst of today. So we see the need for a new hardware model, a need for new processors that are actually designed for these use cases and this type of software, uh, processors that look different than the, so the processors that were used 10, 20, 30 years ago for the client server model. And that's what we've developed at, at Ampere is a new processor uh, that is meant to displace the legacy x86 processors that have served data center demands for the last couple of decades. And why is this so important? Uh, on top of the fact that it makes sense uh, that a more efficient, higher performance piece of hardware is needed, uh, there are also key imperatives that make it um, urgent that we actually go through this transition now versus waiting. And sustainability is one of those, those key areas. If you look at the usage of resources by data centers today, uh, roughly one to 2% of all global electricity was used by data centers in 2020. Uh, this year, cloud data centers in particular are expected to account for 80% of that data center energy demand. And if you look at the growth of cloud over the next decade or so, uh, we'll see a doubling over the next couple of years and probably another doubling right after that in compute capacity required by the cloud. And if nothing else were done, that means that worldwide uh, data center energy consumption would double by 2030. So clearly the 
old legacy model from a hardware perspective uh, is not going to allow us to meet the compute the future compute the needs uh, demand for the cloud in a sustainable way. And it's not just about electricity. It's about water consumption. It's about data center real estate, uh, and it's about the overall carbon footprint. So clearly, we need a new solution in order to grow the cloud sustainably. But we don't want to compromise on performance. And so the paradigm shift that that we've created at at Ampere is one in which we deliver a new architecture that delivers both performance and efficiency for the first time. If you look at the way that legacy x86 processors like Intel Xeon or AMD Epic deliver more performance, uh, they deliver more performance out to the right by just consuming more and more power up, uh, up and to the right. So more performance is more power and more power means more data centers, it means more real estate consumed, it means more water consumed uh, to help cool those data centers. And what we've done is delivered what we call the cloud native processor, and it doesn't compromise on performance. Uh, we're able to actually deliver twice the performance at half the power because of our completely different approach from an architectural and a design perspective. So we believe that this is the type of big shift that is needed. Uh, in order to sustainably meet the future needs of the cloud. On top of that, uh, we've delivered an architecture that delivers completely new capabilities to the, to the cloud. Pierre mentioned at the beginning that our leading processor, Ampere Ultra Max, has 128 cores in the cloud. Cores are capacity. So more cores means more compute, it means more capacity, uh, more resources uh, available to customers. At 128 cores is twice the core count of any other processor that's available today in the market. Um, and on top of the industry leading core count, we've delivered an architecture uh, that does a couple of other key things that are uh, needed in the cloud. The cloud is inherently multi-tenant. There's many, many users that are running uh, their own applications in the cloud. They're sitting on the same physical servers, the same physical infrastructure. Uh, what's key though, is that you wanna avoid interference between those users. Uh, the second chart here is an example of how our processors avoid that interference. This is often called the noisy neighbor problem. And what we're showing here uh, is uh, a Ampere Ultra Max processor running. And every so often when the dotted lines occur, we inject noisy neighbors, another workload that has a tendency to disrupt the core workload that, that you actually care about. Uh, and you can see that the red line is, is pretty, pretty flat. That's what you want to see. It means you're very resilient to noisy neighbors, regardless of what other users are doing on the same servers that you happen to be placed on in the cloud, uh, the performance is maintained at a high level. You can contrast that with an x86 processor, uh, in this case, an AMD processor. Each time that other workload is injected, other users come onto the server, the performance drops. And, and so you can imagine this, this poses big problems uh, for, um, for users of the cloud. And often in order to overcome this, you just run at low utilization, uh, you have unoccupied cores and threads, which means you have a very inefficient implementation. We avoid that by delivering predictable high performance all the time. On top of that, this type of interference can also cause security problems. Uh, you may have heard the last couple of years of a number of the side channel attacks, Many of these are actually related to the way that tenants sit next to each other. They're strangers. Uh, some of them are not good actors, uh, and they actually look to uh, take advantage of information they can glean from the, the server and use that to infer what's happening with other users. That's a security risk, uh, and our processors uh, reduce the ability for users to do that based on the architecture we've created. Also, you want a processor that's very, very scalable. So as you bring more and more cores online, uh, you want the overall performance to actually increase. You don't want to hit bottlenecks uh, that actually limit the upside performance from those additional cores. And you can see here, we deliver 128 cores. As each core comes online, you actually get the expected level of performance versus x86 machines that often get bottlenecked, the power constrained, uh, and their performance actually suffers uh, as they become more and more utilized. And you can imagine that one of the side effects of this is that machines are run at very low utilization and that does not contribute positively from a sustainability perspective. 
And then lastly, we deliver cores that are just very, very power efficient. So we're 128 cores, each one of them consumes 67% less power than the lowest power existing uh, processor from, from AMD. So the, from the start, we have a very, very efficient core, which allows us to scale out in a very, very sustainable manner. And if we quickly just look at what we actually did under the hood, uh, because there's a lot of unique things that we've done from a design and architecture perspective to deliver these three key tenants, this predictable high performance, uh, elasticity and scalability, and a power efficient and sustainable solution, uh, we've taken some very different approaches from an architectural perspective. So rather than uh, using cores that are multi-threaded, uh, which are really client cores being reused in the data center, uh, we have a core that's designed specifically for cloud, uh, and it's single threaded to avoid that type of interference and noisy neighbor problem that I mentioned before. We run at very, very consistent frequencies, um, which allows users to uh, see the same level of performance regardless of what application they're running or what application their neighbors might be running on the same machine. Very, very large core counts that are you know, with cores that are very power and area efficient. Uh, so merely taking a existing core and making some slight modifications to it isn't sufficient. You wouldn't get the type of disruptive uh, architecture that we're delivering. You wouldn't get anywhere near the type of efficiency and uh, scalability that we're able to deliver with our processors. Uh, and then just one example of something that we also did uh, at the architectural level that's really key uh, is we have very large uh, low latency private caches. Uh, a CPU typically has a number of different caches. Some of them are private to individual cores or users, and then some of them are shared across the, the CPU. In those older uh, client server models, having big shared caches could actually be useful because each of the cores is being utilized by a single user. In a cloud environment, having large shared caches is often not useful. In fact, it can actually be a big detriment because you have many, many users that are all trying to access the same cache. Uh, they're all loading new data into it, evicting the contents of other users' uh, cache. Uh, that's not desirable. What we focused on is private caches to each user, so they don't have to worry about that noisy neighbor problem. They don't have to worry about security problems. Uh, and these caches are inherently lower latency. So there's many, many other things that we've done from an architectural perspective, um, but this gives you kind of a glimpse of, of what we did at the heart of the CPU in order to deliver something that's, that's very different and disruptive. And so putting it all together, what did it actually mean in terms of, of real life performance? Um, here we've got five different workloads, very popular workloads for the cloud, but a wide variety. Things like uh, web services, so front end web, uh, which is sort of the heart of uh, often what's running in the cloud, uh, databases that might be backing up those services. Um, we also have in-memory caching, uh, commonly used in cloud services, media transcoding. So this is encoding video that's being delivered across the cloud. And then AI inferencing, which uh, is becoming a very, very important workload um, as people are relying on the cloud to do things like recommendation, language processing, sentiment analysis. Uh, and so on each of these uh, graphs, what we're showing here is the performance and then the performance per watt. Um, because at the end of the day, we wanna be leaders in performance. Uh, and then we wanna lead even further uh, when you uh, look at how much performance we deliver per watt uh, of, uh, of input power to the server. Uh, and you can see here across the board, uh, our processors lead in performance, uh, and then they extend that lead even further from a performance per watt perspective. So uh, once you look at something like performance per watt, we have a lead of anywhere between two and 3.8x over the uh, incumbent and legacy Intel and AMD processors. <clears throat> and the reason why the power efficiency uh, really matters in the cloud, it's not just because of the obvious uh, benefits from a sustainability perspective, but generally in the cloud, uh, someone's deploying racks and racks of servers across a data center. That data center has some power budget. Uh, maybe it's uh, a couple of megawatts. And then that power budget gets divided up at the rack level. And maybe each rack is able to uh, supply 12 kilowatts of, of power. And so the, you know, the key to the game is to deliver the most performance, support the most users, so most cores or most performance within each rack, which is largely dictated by how many cores or how much performance you can get into that rack level power budget. So if you can deliver more performance, more cores into a rack, then you need less racks, which means you consume overall less power and you need less data centers to support the compute demand. 
And then if we look a little bit more broadly at where it is that our processors are, are being deployed, um, you know, we have a number of big wins at the big hyperscalers who are running their, their large central clouds. These are people like uh, Microsoft Azure, uh, Oracle Cloud, Google Cloud, uh, but that's not the only place where our processors are, are being utilized. When you look at the cloud, there's those large public clouds. Uh, and as I mentioned, we have many hyperscalers, so that forms a multi-cloud environment. Then at the other end, we have people like HPE that, are, um, that have built servers. Uh, their new Gen 11 Pro Client line uh, today is based only on Ampere processors. Uh, and so HPE is selling into the private clouds. Uh, because over the next couple of years, we're going to see virtually everything in the data center move to the cloud. Uh, so it's not just about public cloud, it's about enterprises running their own private clouds on-prem. Uh, and so HP is delivering servers into, into that market that are based on, on Ampere processors. And then in the middle of that, you have the hybrid cloud, which is people running across public clouds and their own private cloud. And a good example of this is what HP is doing with GreenLake. Uh, and so GreenLake is their hybrid cloud service, uh, and that also is running on, on Ampere. So having a merchant market processor uh, from Ampere, a cloud data processor, Ampere Ultra, Ultra Max, that can be deployed anywhere across any type of a cloud, creates that consistent user experience uh, and is one of the things that differentiates us from, uh, from other approaches in this market. Uh, and then uh, I'd be remiss if I didn't talk about also what we're doing out in the edge. So when we think about cloud, uh, we don't think about cloud as just you know, big central data centers. The cloud is a type of architecture uh, and cloud architectures are being deployed in these big hyperscale clouds, but they're also being deployed out at very distributed edge locations. So uh, they might be running cloud um, uh, applications out at a 5G base station uh, or a really good example the, of um, one of our customers, Cruise. Uh, Cruise is putting our processors in their vehicles, which is to me basically just a really extreme edge case. Uh, these are cloud servers, they're just sitting in a vehicle and they're performing the same types of um, processing that you would uh, that you would perform in, in the cloud, the same types of general purpose applications. Um, our processors run any application that runs in the cloud, they're not specialized accelerators, these are the core processor. Uh, and so we're able to uh, tackle the needs of everything from big central clouds to uh, small distributed edges, thanks to our power efficiency. So to wrap it up before uh, before I hand it back over to to Pierre, um, you know we are driving this platform for the next era of computing, this cloud native platform, which today uh, or until Ampere came on the scene, lacked the hardware solution on the processor side to make it fully cloud native end to end. We built this grounds up platform for cloud native environments. Uh, we've got a great track record of, of innovation. Uh, we have a long-term roadmap uh, that includes many, many products out into the future. Um, as we look out into the future, we're really well positioned to address the future of compute with our own custom cores uh, that we've developed entirely within Ampere. Uh, we're going to be able to continue to push the envelope in terms of performance, efficiency, and features needed for the cloud. Uh, we've got very strong relationship. I mentioned some of the key customers that we have today. Uh, there's a growing list of other customers. Uh, we've got a great ecosystem, whether it is around ODMs and OEMs building platforms or software developers that are building on us. Uh, and we have a very, very proven uh, management and engineering team. Uh, Renee James is our CEO. She has decades of experience having been president of Intel. Uh, we have a very, very deep executive team with, uh, with decades of experience building big things at scale, you know, ready to disrupt the uh, the legacy model with with what comes next, and with that, um, I will hand it back over to Pierre uh, for some follow up questions. Thanks, Jeff. Um, thanks, Jeff. Um, great, uh, great presentation. Very exciting. Let me. Uh, let me start like with uh, like a rear mirror question, like a backward looking question. Uh, you, you've spent quite a lot of time at Intel. You've been uh, leading their uh, cloud and custom silicon efforts. So you must have been in touch uh, with these cloud clients. And we, I'd love to hear you about what you learned in your experience about what their needs are, how you identified the gap 
uh, and, and what were like the key frustrations or demands or, um, of, of these clients when you that you knew when you went into the MP adventure? Yeah, as you mentioned, I had years of uh, of working with with cloud customers. As um, you know, as you mentioned, I was running the cloud uh, business at Intel for the last couple of years that I was there. I was also responsible for the the custom CPUs that we were building for customers. So I was very very familiar. Uh, with cloud customers uh, and what their requirements were. And it was really clear that the legacy approaches just weren't well suited for their needs. Taking a processor that has been used for you know, 20, 30 years and kind of shoehorning it into this type of use case was no longer sufficient. It lacked the performance scalability. Uh, it lacked the efficiency that's required uh, because again, whether you care about efficiency because you care about you know, operating costs because you care about sustainability or you just care about capacity. Uh, this is a key constraint in the, in the data center space. So it was clear that um, coupled with the software shift that everyone had made towards cloud native applications, that really a, a new and different approach was required for the processor. Uh, and it was clear that somebody needed to step in and, and build that new cloud native processor. Uh, and that was, that was a big reason why I chose to, to leave and, and come to Ampere, which was Ampere was building what really fit into my vision that there was a different and modern way of building processors. And this was an opportunity to actually build that processor from the ground up. And, and that's what we did with Ampere Ultra and, and Ampere Ultra Max. That makes a lot of sense. And, uh, and what I hear is a very, very typical you know, innovator uh, strategy in, in our space, which is uh, how starting from a blank sheet of paper, you can actually do well. But now I'm going to ask you the question probably most of the audience have uh, has in mind, which is we've seen a lot of attempts of ARM architectures to get into the data center and into cloud. And there has been some like very, very recent successes like with custom silicon, like a proprietary silicon and come back to that. but. Overall, there has been a lot of failures. So what's different this time? What, what is Ampere bringing to the table that is going to make, uh, make them successful this time, make ARM successful this time? Right. Yeah, that, that's a question we get a lot. And I think to, to start it off, um, I think kind of reframing what it, our goals are and what it is that we're doing is important. Because our, our goal isn't to build a, an ARM-based processor uh, for the data center. Our goal is to build a cloud-native processor for the data center that's specific, that is specifically focused on the needs of the, of the cloud. That's the disruptive innovation that we're bringing to the market. And that's the reason why we're seeing so much success. I mentioned um, Microsoft, Google, Oracle. We also have uh, customers like Alibaba and Tencent, Baidu, ByteDance. So when you look across the big customers, seven of the biggest hyperscalers uh, are already deploying us. Uh, we've got great adoption with the, the next wave cloud and digital service providers. But I think it's that focus on the cloud that's what differentiates our approach from all the previous data center CPUs, including those from, from Intel and from, from AMD. So the ARM instruction set, it's a good place to start. Um, but again, that's not the disruptive aspect of what we're doing. Um, it's one of the design aspects um, out of many of the different design aspects. Um, and the fact that you know, we built a custom core for what we call Ampere One. Ampere One is our, our next product. It's sampling out to customers. Um, right now. And so it's building those really disruptive custom cores that are really well suited for the cloud. That's been our strategy since day one. That's what's going to allow us to continue to innovate uh, and extend our, our performance. Because if you look at off the shelf IP from ARM, which is largely what people have used in the past, it just doesn't deliver the, the superior performance that's, that's demanded. Um, you know, in order to deliver extreme performance, extreme efficiency, it requires this intense focus on, on what customers need. Uh, and we're the only one that's really uh, focused on that and delivered something that's that has a very specific use case, and that's uh, and that's for the cloud. Um, and um, you know, I think the custom cores is is a key piece of how we're going to be able to continue to extend that. Um, that's going to give that gives us complete control to innovate in every single aspect uh, of the of the processor, and it's allowed us to build uh, a, a very large portfolio of our of our own IP. I guess just to wrap it up, the other thing that is often um, overlooked is just the overall ecosystem and, and what needs to be enabled when you're bringing a disruptive technology like this to the market. Um, and that includes both the software side, it also includes the, the hardware side. 
Um, so I think that when you look at earlier efforts to disrupt x86, you know, the software ecosystem was too immature. Uh, today, though, the software ecosystem is very mature. Uh, that's because of a combination of the shift in a software paradigm to cloud native that makes things inherently very, very portable, uh, but also the amount of work that's, that's occurred over the last decade, a lot of it from Ampere in ensuring that all applications, because like I said before, we're a general purpose processor, we're running all applications in the cloud uh, and all those applications, all those operating systems, they all run today right out of the box on our processors. And the last piece of it is the hardware piece of it. So it's the ODM, the OEM ecosystem. Uh, we have nine different ODMs and OEMs that are building systems for us today. 40 different platforms. So whether somebody wants a, a box that's well suited for you know, very, very dense compute or storage or some sort of GPU um, accelerated box, there's a wide variety of, of platforms for them. So we kind of reach that critical mass where it's easy for anyone to go and buy a server uh, that does what they want. So, um, so I think that, you know, to maybe to summarize, um, one, it's that focus on the cloud and two, it's doing all the enabling work everywhere around it that is allowing us to actually disrupt the market. Okay, that makes a lot of sense. And let me come back to um, um, the archi arch architectural part. So if I understand you correctly, you are like um, uh, what we call like an architectural licensee from ARM. You've been developing your own core. So you take the instruction set, but you've done your own core. And of course you've designed the overall chip by yourself. Could you tell us, you know, what would be in your mind the number one like innovation design effort you've made inside the core and for your overall chip architecture. So if you were to pick one in each area, what were like the most important focus, innovation focus of Ampere in the product development process? Yeah, yeah, I think um, there's probably two main areas. So one is the, the way that we've architected the entire SOC, so the entire chip, in order to be scale out uh, to, to really high core counts. Right, so it's not trivial to deliver more than 64 cores. There's, there's a reason why um, we've seen uh, 64 cores kind of be the limit when it comes to current x86 processors, even other ARM processors today. Um, there isn't anything else out there in, in the market um, that, that goes above 64 cores. So uh, one of the key areas that we focused on was that SOC level um, innovation to make sure that we designed um, and, uh, and optimize the mesh that connects up the cores to be able to uh, monitor traffic uh, around the cores between the IO and the memory, uh, make sure that traffic is, is being able to be uh, controlled in a really fair and consistent manner and avoid any, any bottlenecks. And uh, one big key piece of that also is the way that we manage power across the entire processor. Um, again, managing it in a fair way uh, that creates very, very balanced performance and allows you to, to get to that scalability that I showed earlier, where x86 sort of tails off, we're able to continue to scale up. So I think that's number one is how did we actually, you know, the innovations that we made at the architectural level that allows to scale beyond a point that anyone else has been capable of. And then the other one is within the, the core itself, especially with Ampere 1 uh, and beyond, uh, you know, it's a custom core. So from the ground up, we built every single element of the microarchitecture. Uh, and I think it's our methodology that is, is probably most important there. Uh, we've worked with the key customers. We have workloads in house uh, that allow us to run simulations in pre-silicon. And by having a mindset where every decision we make around the microarchitecture, they're all data-based. Um, so they're all based on whether we see the expected increase in performance at the workload level, uh, but they're also done with efficiency and area in mind. Uh, so each time we make a change, we're looking to make changes that deliver more performance for the amount of incremental power or the amount of incremental area that, uh, that we introduce into the design. I, I think that that's a, that's a very different approach uh, than if you were trying to use one processor to hit every possible market or every possible use case um, out in the data center space, there's an inclination to kind of kitchen sink everything and you end up with something that's, uh, that's just not as streamlined and as focused. And I think that that extreme focus in our entire methodology from architecture to design to validation to the way that we enable our customers has been, has been a key reason why we've, we've been so successful. Okay, that makes a lot of sense. Thanks for the, thanks for the details. Um, 
Let, let's talk about like your market environment now. So you, you talk a lot about um, uh, x86 and like the two, two players uh, de facto here, um, Intel and, uh, and AMD. Um, we've actually seen quite successful moves uh, for in-house um, processors like uh, AWS Graviton. Um, we, we see that volumes are actually picking up for, for this chip and we see that most cloud players have some sort of at least a project of doing their own CPU. So tell us about maybe your product marketing strategy, like how do you, how do you position yourself in this market? We, we understand the difference here, very strong differentiation with legacy. What about innovation coming from your clients themselves? Mm -hmm. No, good question. Um, you know, I think when you look at the um, the AWS situation, which is the you know the other processor with the Graviton processors that are that are out there today, um, I think their situation is a little bit unique because uh, when you look at when they bought Annapurna, there really weren't any non-X86 alternatives out there that were competitive. So developing in-house was really their only choice um, at that point if they wanted to move away from from legacy X86 processors. And clearly, that's not the case today. We have a solution that, that's actually um, even higher performance, higher core count uh, than them, uh, and is really well suited for, for cloud compute. So that's why we've seen the big wins that we have with the rest of the hyperscalers. Um, you know, and, and we've been able to deliver that exceptional solution um, in a pretty short amount of time. We've been around for, for four and a half years. Uh, we've got two products in market and the third one that's sampling out to, to customers right now. I think though, when you look strategically, um, why is it that what we're doing um, is, uh, you know, is advantaged? It, it's because of the fact that we are a merchant market silicon provider and we can enable multiple clouds uh, all running the same processor, which simplifies things for, for the users uh, and makes it easier to build up uh, a entire network of developers that are developing on, on Ampere processors. Um, just last week, Hone Honeycomb, for example, um, they, they talked about the fact that having processors available from Ampere across many, many different clouds was really important. And that, that means their developers aren't locked into a single cloud. They have a choice. They can run on Azure. They can run Oracle Cloud. They can run at GCP. And that means they can serve more, more customers. So I think that there's a, great, there's a great advantage to having the ability to serve many, many clouds. And then when you look at our overall market, strategy and, and what we were focused on, we focused first on the hyperscalers, then we focused on the, the next wave uh, cloud providers and digital service providers. Uh, and we're winning there uh, with people like uh, Hetzner over in Europe that are using our processors, um, NetEase in, in China is using it for cloud gaming. Uh, but then there's the piece that there's the uh, on-prem private cloud piece. I think that's why the HPE uh, approach is, is, is really, really valuable for us because now we've linked together all different types of deployment models, public cloud, private cloud, hybrid in between. Uh, and I think that's a, you know, that is a key advantage is one solution um, that works. We hit scale across the market. Um, and, and then on top of that, you've got the fact that, um, you know, we can go into these really constrained edge environments, uh, which when you look at it from a developer perspective is really important because now they can run uh, say their development loops on same types of hardware all the way from uh, big cloud where they might be doing the development efforts, maybe all the way out into the edge, which is which is where they actually might be deploying their application and utilizing it for customers. So I think it's that versatility and scale that's that's really critical. And it's just something that anything in-house is going to inherently fall short of by its very definition. Thanks, Jeff. So you've mentioned your um client list, uh, it's not even a prospect list, uh, they are actually uh, ramping up their technology as we speak. So Microsoft, Google, and uh, most, um, most like um, usual suspects in, in this area. Let me ask you um, about the adoption of Ampere from a slightly different perspective, which, which is a use case. Um, so I, I'd like to come back to this like cloud native processor uh, branding or like a qualification that, that, that you're using. What do you mean by cloud here? Is, is MPS processor aimed at being a very generalist chip that could replace x86 on absolutely everything? Or is there a pattern in which you have a certain type of workloads where 
you're going to do great first and that's where you're going to start. And so you, your market entry strategy is actually focused on, on more specific use cases. So my question number one would probably be, where are your clients ramping MPA today? Is that only testing for now or is that not more, uh, more tangible? And is that the case, what kind of workload? And my question number two is, what's your internal view? How do you see MPA getting traction on which kind of workloads? And what, what's the roadmap to, to broaden the scope of our time of the architecture? Yeah. Um, so I think to answer your first question, um, you know, I think the answer is yes, we can displace all the x86 processors um, that are out there today. When you look at our focus, it's not workload specific. Um, we can run any workload uh, that, uh, that runs really anywhere. So it's, it's not about our processors focusing on specific types of workloads. It's about focusing on a specific infrastructure type, which is the cloud. Um, an infrastructure that's really, really scalable, that demands predictable performance, that needs to be really efficient. And so we're that general purpose processor um, that excels in that type of environment. Uh, and so when you look at the shift in the market from non-cloud to cloud, eventually over the next um, couple of years into the next decade, everything is going to move over into a, a cloud infrastructure. Now it could look totally, you know, there could be totally different types of clouds. Um, and so I'm not using cloud to refer to just big hyperscalers and public cloud. I'm using cloud, you know, to refer to a cloud infrastructure that could be sitting anywhere, could be run by anyone, and is going to be running all workloads. So really it's a, you know, it's a general purpose CPU that can run anything, but it just does all of that, like that bulk processing, all the kind of workhorse processing that has to occur uh, for the cloud. That's what we're displacing x86 in. Um, and when you look at what our customers are actually running on it, it's a, it's a mix of, they're using it for internal applications uh, to serve their own say SaaS products or uh, past products or just completely internal services. And then they're also making it available uh, via their public clouds. So as IaaS uh, services out to um, many, many other, other customers. Um, and they've made instances available that have different, different compute um, elements that uh, some of which you know, have more intense memory and, and storage features. Um, and so when we look at what their end customers are are using it for it's it's kind of across the the board. It's we've seen you know, web services, we've seen databases, we've seen um, a lot of AI inferencing. Um, one common thread is a lot of them are are running in containers and using Kubernetes as the uh, as the management layer uh, for that. That's kind of one of those key elements of of cloud native application uh, development that that pairs really well uh, with our processors. Um, and I'll just say a couple of like really specific examples. Uh, of what end users are running in the cloud. Uh, Red Bull Racing, for instance, is running on uh, Oracle Cloud and they're using our, uh, our instances at Oracle Cloud and they're doing their pre and their in-race uh, simulations and analytics. They were able to get 25% more uh, simulations run in a given amount of time, which time is critically important to them, um, you know, versus what they could do with x86 processors or, or Ronin is using it for um, as the, part of their healthcare analytics platform. Uh, you know, they're able to get faster and cheaper results for things like cancer treatments. Um, and then Amadeus is one that's running in Azure, for instance, uh, and they're using it for their, uh, for their travel platform, which has a bunch of different elements, the, the, the web servers, the caching, the databases. So a wide variety of applications um, that we see this used in. And, and as I said, it's because of the versatility of it and the fact that we're focused on an infrastructure type, not a workload type. Okay. And you, you mentioned your partnership um, with, uh, with HP. Um, so so can, can you tell us a bit more um, uh, there? So what is HP doing with, uh, uh, with your chips? And what's, uh, what, what's the target? Is that to serve still like fairly large uh, cloud clients, but what we call like the tier two of cloud? Or mm -hmm. are you already uh, uh, looking at the, the broader enterprise market? Yeah, yeah, it's, um, I think the HP one is um, probably can't be underestimated, like how big of a validation this is of the strategy that we put into place. Um, first, the, the easy low hanging fruit is going and winning the tier two cloud uh, with, with HPE, but that's not really the key strategic value. The key strategic value is that it allows us to go and win enterprises running their own on-prem private clouds using the HPE servers that they're all used to. Um, and the fact that HP 
uh, put Ampere in their Proliant Gen 11 line. Again, today it's the only processor that's actually available in that Gen 11 line. Kind of shows their uh, recognition that this is the disruptive approach that they need uh, in order to make a bigger shift to, to cloud. Um, another thing that's really interesting is that traditionally um, HP has uh, used their own proprietary firmware stack called ILO with their customers. So their customers, you know, they, they know this well, they love it, their enterprise customers um, are, are well used to it. One, our, our servers use ILO, which is, which is key. It shows that what, we de what we've developed is robust enough. It's rock solid for enterprises. But the interesting thing is that HP also is enabling open source firmware like OpenBMC on the platform. So you can see where they're sort of embracing um, both sides. They're embracing the fact there's enterprises that aren't, far, that aren't as far along in their journey that need the same enterprise type stack. And that's what they're gonna use to start out in the cloud. And then there's others that have already moved to uh, a much more cloud-like approach and are using a lot of open source uh, software. And so the HP, um, the strategy is, uh, I think, a good example of how we're going out and capturing uh, wide swaths of the market. And uh, I mentioned earlier too, GreenLake is their hybrid cloud. And so that's, that's also bridging that gap and allowing people to utilize our processors in both private and, and public clouds. So uh, we, we just have like a, a couple of minutes left. So let me ask you one last question and go back to your product strategy. Uh, everybody here is, um, you know, the focus on energy e efficiency and uh, everybody understands why it is so important. Uh, but you've mentioned also a lot of predictability and scalability. So ca can you tell us, you know, what's, um, uh, what do these dimensions really mean to your clients? Why are they important? And what in your architecture is addressing those? Right, yeah, I mean, I think when you look at it, you know, performance is table stakes. Um, efficiency is what is allowing us to, uh, to go in and, and really disrupt things and create a new sustainable model. Uh, but there are el other elements um, that are important architecturally for our customers. Um, in order to help them deliver new services and uh, deploy in ways that they were never capable of deploying before, they need things like scalability, uh, predictability. Uh, this is allowing them to kind of take some of the band-aids off that they've used in the past. Um, where they've had to even hamstring the legacy processors to work around elements of the architecture that weren't really well suited for the cloud at all. Um, and so it's important that we keep innovating in these types of, of areas uh, and allow them to keep deploying at massive scale um, and, uh, you know, and, and really change their deployment models um, in the future. Um, you know, when we look at everything, we're look at, we look at everything at, at scale. You know, our processors are being deployed uh, in racks and racks across many, many data centers. So that, like, every problem we solve, it's not about solving a problem that works in one individual core. It's about solving problems that are going to actually be applicable across a massive environment, you know, thousands, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of cores and CPUs. Um, and I think those are some of the new disruptive um, ideas that we're bringing forth in, in some of our future processors. Uh, really to, to keep allowing that innovation to occur at the infrastructure and the software level with the, the basis, uh, you know, with our cloud native processors below. Okay. Jeff, um, thank you so much for your time today. Uh, once again, it was a real pleasure to have you for our Big ID conference. Uh, and we, we look forward um, to uh, being in touch and following the, the further successes of Ampere in uh, in the next few years. So good luck with all, uh, all the endeavors and, uh, and stay in touch. Thanks, Pierre. Thanks for inviting us. And uh, yeah, look forward to sharing more with you in the future as we, uh, as we continue to release more products and see more success.